So trustworthy machine learning is crucial for many reasons. Um, and I'm going to start the presentation by giving you an overview of several of these. And maybe from, from this, you'll get the impression that there is uh, a possibility that attacking machine learning is easier than defending it. And so that this would result in an arms race between attackers and defenders. And this is exactly the goal of this presentation, is to think about how we can design machine learning algorithms that are trustworthy. And so by trustworthy here, I mean uh, a, notion, a composition of properties that include things like security, privacy, but also safety, fairness, and ethics. So this is what I'll start by discussing first. As we look through the entire pipeline of machine learning, uh, both during training and test time, we've already seen instances of adversaries actively manipulating the inputs that algorithms are processing. So if we look at uh, what malicious individuals did on Twitter when Microsoft released uh, their Tay chat bot, we quickly saw that they had the ability to poison the training set that this chat bot was using to produce new content. And so the chat bot inevitably learn how to produce things like racist content. So this is one of the tweets that the bot produced, one of the only ones that I'm comfortable putting on <laughs> this slide. But even if the model is already trained and deployed and is making predictions, uh, because very often the input domain is so large, the model will not make correct predictions on all of the possible inputs. And so we've seen things like when YouTube uses machine learning to filter videos that are not appropriate for children, some of the videos will evade this detection mechanism, again, because the model will not always correctly predict. Even when there are no adversaries at play, we may be concerned about safety. And there has been demonstrations by researchers taking machine learning algorithms used for self-driving applications and showing that these algorithms are very sensitive to simple changes of lighting in uh, the images that they're processing, which sort of result in very drastically different actions being taken. Here you can see how the algorithm would steer the wheel. Other aspects of trustworthy machine learning relate more to societal uh, components of trustworthiness. Uh, for instance, as we're deploying machine learning algorithms, we have to be uh, careful that they're respectful of the data that they're analyzing. Uh, and one component of this is privacy. As we're using data that is sometimes very sensitive, we have to be concerned that machine learning models may be uh, memorizing some of their training data. And this is, in fact, what some researchers demonstrated where they took a facial, uh, facial recognition model and they were able to reconstruct a face from one of the persons that were used in the training set. So here what you see on the left is the person, and on the right is the image that they were able to reconstruct. And finally, there are a lot of components that relate to the more ethical aspects of machine learning. In particular, if we look at uh, the predictions of models on populations that are underrepresented in the data sets, they typically tend uh, to be less accurate. So for instance, uh, again, fa facial recognition models have been shown to perform poorly on uh, images of women or people of color. But there are also other components related to uh, the progress that we're seeing in generative modeling. So as models are getting better at generating content that is realistic, we have to be concerned as to the ability of machine learning to manipulate the public discourse that uh, we are all interacting with. And so I'll come back to this in the conclusion of this talk. So next, I'd like to discuss how we can design training algorithms that will provide these notions of trustworthy machine learning and escape this arms race. But I'll start with a failed attempt just to capture how difficult this problem is. So when we tried first to build models that recognize handwritten digits, so this is what appears like a very simple problem, 
you have images like the one that I'm showing on the screen, and you're trying to tell with confidence what digit is in the image. It turns out these models, like many machine learning classifiers, are very vulnerable to small perturbations of their inputs called adversarial examples, and we'll hear more about those in the next talk. Um, and so to make models more robust to these perturbations, the community next looked at a definition of robustness, which basically requires that the model be constant around its training inputs. So what you're seeing here on the left is you have a training image for the class three, which is in the center of this disk, which is defined by a certain distance metric. And you can see that the model that we've trained, which is the dotted red line, does not match exactly the ideal black line that we'd like to achieve. And so we're asking the model so that it's less vulnerable to small perturbations to instead be constant in the disk around the training image. And so we'll achieve models like this here where we have the dotted black line, which is now squeezed between the two disks and is now robust to these small perturbations. But by doing that, because the reality is not made of these small disks, we've made the model more vulnerable to new forms of attacks. And it now misclassifies the image of a five here that is shown because it is very close according to this distance to the image of the three, but semantically it's very different because it's from a different class. And so because we have this conflict between the def definition of security and what we're trying to achieve with machine learning, we're not able to achieve both at the same time. And because the error space is so large, we've basically uh, resulted in an arms race where we come up with defenses against specific attacks and then attackers come up with new uh, attacks. So does that mean that achieving trustworthy machine learning is any different than what we've seen in more traditional computer systems? where very often we end up in an arms race and we have to balance the cost of protection with the risk of loss. I would like to argue that it's not the case, that machine learning brings a paradigm that is sufficiently novel for us to reason differently, and in particular in a principled way. And that is because machine learning makes it a lot easier to describe the behavior of the system formally. Um, and to convince you that that's the case, I'm going to walk you through uh, progress that we've made in privacy-preserving machine learning. So whereas we've made very little progress in achieving a robust machine learning, we've made a lot more progress in achieving privacy-preserving machine learning. So what do we mean by privacy-preserving? We fortunately have a definition called differential privacy, which requires that the algorithm that we're analyzing have behavior that is indistinguishable to an observer when the algorithm is operating on a first version of the data that contains the record corresponding to an individual, or when the algorithm is operating on a second version of the data that does not contain this record. What this means is the person observing our, our algorithm is unable to tell whether we included the record for that specific individual in the data set or not. And so in turn, this person cannot learn anything about the individual or any private information that would have been included in the data set. And we can formalize this by looking at probabilities uh, that the algorithm make certain outputs. So how do, how do we do this in practice? Well, if we train machine learning models, typically we'll use something like stochastic gradient descent, where we take a batch of data, we compute the error of the model in this batch of data, and we derive from this error gradients of the error with respect to the model parameters. And this allows us to tune the model parameters to decrease the error of the model. Well, if we want to do this with privacy, we're going to make very small changes. First, we're going to compute the error on a per example basis. What this means is we can then compute gradients of these errors with respect to model parameters also on a per example basis. And so we know how much the training algorithm is extracting from each individual training example to update the model parameters. And so if we clip, clip these gradients, we control their magnitude, and we can bound how much the algorithm is sensitive 
to these individual training examples. And then we add a little bit of noise to get the notion of indistinguishability that I discussed previously. What's very interesting is if we look at privacy-preserving models, their behavior tells us a lot about the data that they're analyzing. Here I'm showing, again, my example of handwritten digits. And I'm modeling this just as a very simple distribution. And here you can see the tails of the distribution where you have very unusual examples of digits. It turns out to be able to learn these digits, you have to configure the privacy-preserving algorithm very loosely to provide very weak notions of privacy, which means you basically don't clip the gradients too much and you don't introduce that much noise. And so the algorithm is able to extract information from these corner cases. If instead we strengthen the privacy guarantee, now we're going to be unable to learn about these tails, but we're going to be able to learn about these new examples, which are a little bit more prototypical, right? They look a lot more like digits to me. And if we continue to strengthen the privacy guarantee, then we are only able to learn about these very canonical examples from the data. And so what this shows you is that when we learn with privacy, we are doing exactly what we wanted to do in the first place when we started using machine learning, which is to extract patterns that generalize well to other examples. So we're really learning about general patterns rather than specific details from individual examples. Another cool thing about learning with privacy is that it tells us a lot about how we should design machine learning models. So if you are in the business of designing machine learning models and you know that you're going to learn with privacy, you're going to end up making completely different design choices. One very sim simple example is, if without privacy, typically the more parameters you add to your model, the better the model will perform. Instead, when you're learning with privacy, there is an inflection point after which adding more parameters will simply degrade the performance of the model. And this makes sense because if you remember the way that I described the privacy-preserving training algorithm, it clips the information that you get from training examples to have a maximum magnitude. And so if you have lots of parameters, what this means is you're going to end up splitting this small amount of information across all of the parameters. So the more parameters you have, the less each parameter gets to learn from your training examples. And so what this shows us in conclusion is when we're thinking about designing training algorithms that are trustworthy, it really matters what definition we're working with. Whereas with robustness to adversarial examples, we haven't made much progress. With differential privacy, we don't have a necessary trade-off between privacy and utility because the notions that we're trying to achieve are very compatible. And when we are unable to achieve privacy, we have this smooth degradation that I visualize with the tails of the distribution. Does that mean that we're done? Not quite yet, because we've only talked about the training phase. The next question is what happens at test time? And here I think there are two directions that we need to work on, and there has been very little work so far in that direction. I'll give you two examples of things that we've been looking at. The first one is mission control. And here the idea is that we want to have a mechanism to understand when our model is unable to specify some of these properties that we wanted to achieve at training. And one very simple example of this is computing the uncertainty of predictions that the model is making. It's in general very difficult to estimate how uncertain a model is about making a prediction. And it's very difficult because these uncertainty estimations are not well calibrated. So what we've done is we've decided to open up the box and look at the internal representations that machine learning models extract from their data. For instance, when you have neural networks, you can just look at the intermediate outputs that each layer uh, is producing. And using that, we're able to look in the training data and to search for the support that we have in making a specific prediction. And by looking at the geometry of the support, we can estimate how certain or uncertain the algorithm is in making a specific prediction. Another aspect of trustworthy machine learning at test time is model governance. And by this, I mean the fact that we don't pay much attention to what happens to our models once they've been deployed. 
And if you think about it with new legislation uh, like the GDPR that are promoting things like the right to be forgotten, you will have to pay a lot of attention to what happens to your model once it's deployed. For instance, users might come to you and request that their, their data be deleted. And so what do you do? Do you just delete all the models that you created using this data? Of course, that's not very optimal. And so what we've been looking at is ways to shard and slice data sets in a way that it makes it easier to save intermediate states of the model during training, which means that at test time, when someone comes to us and requests to unlearn their data, we can revert the model back to an earlier state and continue training from that, which saves a lot of uh, computations. So this is something we call machine unlearning. So to conclude, I think it's really important to first think about the policies that we're trying to achieve. Here, I've talked about security and privacy, but there are other uh, notions that I mentioned earlier in the talk, like fairness. And in particular, it's interesting to think about those in combination. It's, for instance, very likely that achieving fairness in conjunction with privacy will be difficult because populations that will be affected by the lack of fairness will often be populations for which you don't have much data. So it will be difficult to learn from them with strong privacy guarantees. Technology needs to evolve to provide at training time robustness guarantees uh, that these policies are met. And at test time, we need to have admission control, but also model governance. But sometimes technology will not solve everything. If you think about deepfakes, we wrote a recent think piece about it, where we conclude that any progress made in detecting deepfakes will actually help us design better deepfakes. Because the technology is such that generative models are trained by defeating what is essentially a detector for deepfakes. And so here it's clear that technology will not provide an answer to deepfakes and that we have to look at other forms of solutions like legal frameworks or simply education. That said, I hope that in this uh, presentation I conveyed my enthusiasm for the fact that trustworthy machine learning is an opportunity to make machine learning better. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions you may have.